It's just a little different than the series that we have been doing, and it was based on a devotional that I had during the week, and I had been planning and studying for a further message in our uh, Colossians 2 series, but the Lord has led me to preach out of 1 Kings chapter 17. So if you turn there with me to 1 Kings chapter 17, I hope that uh, you have your Bible and just make sure to reduce any distractions or anything that might pull aside your attention, and uh, let's uh, serve the Lord together this morning as we look at what He has for us in the Bible. So 1 Kings chapter 17, and I'm going to read the first 16 verses. <clears throat> and Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be, that thou shalt drink of the brook, and that I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to all the word of the Lord, and he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he was come to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. Behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. And bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you would bless the preaching of your word. I pray especially for the hearers as they hear this message. I pray, Father, that you would work in their hearts. I pray, Father, that they would be open <clears throat> to the preaching and teaching of your truth. Father, we pray for the leading of thy spirit now, the empowerment that only you can bring. God, thank you for the opportunity to meet together as a church through this medium. In Jesus' name, amen. Elijah appears suddenly in 1 Kings chapter 17. He is so filled with the power of God that he dominates the end of 1 Kings and on into 2 Kings. He is unique in his standing before God because he is one of the two men that appeared before the Lord Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. It was both Elijah and Moses that stood in those honored position. Elijah is a unique prophet. He influenced Israeli thought for centuries following his appearance. Now, he's not what we would normally think of as a great preacher. He was rough. He was not especially polished. He lived with rough clothes of camel's hair. He lived in caves. And he was a very, very fast and athletic man. So let's forget the idea of a man of God being soft and effeminate. The great men of the Bible were both gentle and sweet and yet tough and rugged. They were not pretty to look at or smooth spoken to hear, but they were filled with spiritual power that transformed hearts and by God's grace enabled them to have a great effect on their generation. Now, Elijah, it must be remembered, appears in the northern kingdom. Now, the northern kingdom is the kingdom that was very, very away from God. So for over 200 years, God had been warning them about their gross immorality. And while we won't go into that this morning, let's suffice it to say that it included uh, quite a bit of debauchery 
and cruelty, including human sacrifice. As they turned away from God and into these, these cultic religions, they degenerated as a people. And God warned them over and over again. He reached out to them so many times, and yet they would not hear. And so eventually, God is going to judge the nation. So as God begins to bring this judgment upon the nation by the Assyrians in, in modern-day northern Iraq, as they begin to assemble and grow in power to eventually basically obliterate the northern kingdom where they're absorbed into the Assyrian nation and taken back to those lands. A few remain in the land and they become the Samaritans of the New Testament. But before God does that, he gives a warning or he gives a judgment. Sometimes God will use things like a drought in order to gain our attention. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 17, the Bible says, And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, and there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. God used droughts, which were epidemics, essentially as a warning. Essentially, he was communicating with the people of God, trying to gain their attention and trying to teach them that he was going to move among them. So before the judgment, there was the drought. The heavens were closed, essentially. They were not yielding rain, and it was a picture of their lack of communication and their lack of relationship with God in heaven. God gives a warning before he gives a judgment. Though I'm preaching this morning in the midst of the COVID-19 virus epidemic, it is not the first or the last epidemic that you and I will experience. One of the things that I find quite interesting in this epidemic is how vulnerable it has made us feel. How in the midst of incredible death and destruction, as hundreds of thousands have died, as people have experienced so much misery and joblessness, it is interesting how what so many have looked to as bastions of power and authority stand completely helpless. Governments cannot resolve this. While people are dying, while homes are, are, are being wrecked and businesses, lifelong works are being destroyed because people cannot go to work, it's interesting to see just how vulnerable and just how fragile our world really is. We are cocooning in our homes because no one can fix this. We're told, wash our hands and keep our distance from each other because no one can fix this. Come back to us later because there's nothing that they can do. Where are the great pharmaceutical companies? Where is the science of the scientists who tenaciously hold to the fact that they have answers beyond empirical evidence, that they have answers as such as evolution because we don't need God? They have the answers. And if you want to know more, then you look to them. They have the answers of science, and it's in evolution and in their godless philosophies as spearheaded by Richard Dawkins. My friend, the virus has slain them. Academia is dumbfounded. We are studying it, and we will get back with you. Our businesses are collapsing. Healthcare is creaking under the load. People are sick. And yet the most intelligent people on earth are unable to deal with this virus, this form of influenza. The message of godless intelligentsia, that they have the answer, has been unearthed. They have not the answer. They stand impotent and powerless in the midst of this epidemic. And it reveals to us they are not infallible. They are not above God. They cannot speak for God. They cannot rule in the place of God. They cannot displace God. God rules alone. And he alone is able to accomplish what it is that he wants to accomplish. And while I'm not saying that God caused or sent the COVID-19 virus, it is interesting. And I think that perhaps there is just a teeny, teeny chance that people will begin to think again about what they have placed their hope in, that they will begin to think again 
about those who have sought to give them all of the answers. They will think again about the secular, godless academia that seeks to give them what they cannot give because the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in the Godhead. That is where we find the truth that liberates us from the darkness that is in this world. And while we respect science and love science, for si when science is what it really is, we do not um, follow those who use science to pervert the Bible and, and dismiss the Bible. And I think this COVID-19 virus has exposed them. They don't have all the answers. They, they stand helpless. Their hands are out. Wash your hands. Don't go to get too close to each other because there is nothing that they can do at this moment for this virus. The increasing frequency of epidemics fulfills Bible prophecy. It teaches us things about the way that God is working in our world. If you look with me in Matthew 24 and verse number 5, Matthew 24 and verse number 5, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24 and verse 5, it says, Many shall come in my name, Jesus speaking of this end time. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Do you have a witness, Mormons? And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Since 1990, there have been 21 major wars involving the death of at least 50,000 people. 21 since 1990. Did you know since the year 1900, there have been over 65 major famines. There is an ongoing famine in Yemen and South Sudan right now. Did you know that there are over 12,000 earthquakes every year since the year 2010? 12,000 a year in diverse places. But not only that, since the year 2003, there has been an earthquake every year that has been over eight on the Richter scale, except for two years where there were 7.8s. Amazing. Earthquakes such as the one in um, Japan in 2011 that was a 9.1 and killed nearly 21,000 people. Jesus said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Did you know that natural disasters in our world are increasing at an unprecedented rate? And to say that this is the result of carbon warming is laughable. It is not the result of carbon warming. Since 1970, the average of natural disasters was 78. In 2004, it jumped to 348. Between 1980 and 2009, it's estimated there was an 80% increase in natural disasters. These are the evidences of God moving our world towards the last days. We are moving towards the time when the church will be raptured out. We are moving towards the time when God will fulfill his plan in the seven-year tribulation and, the, and the, then the entering into of the millennial kingdom. Look with me in Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 4. And then we'll come back here to Matthew 24. Daniel 12 and verse number 4. You see, the Bible vividly describes life in the last days. And he says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. He's telling us that there would be unique phenomena at the end, at the, the, the close of the ages. One of those would be tra people would travel at an unprecedented scale. Did you know in 2018, there were 1.4 billion tourist arrivals, not million, billion tourist arrivals. France alone, France alone, excuse me, has over 80 million tourists a year. Knowledge is increasing. Did you know, if you're a younger person who is watching this, that before the year 1995, 2000, that people did not 
use the internet, did not have the internet or go on the internet. People had paper catalogs and they would go to their library if they wanted information or they would talk to an expert on the phone about something. But now we have what is a virtual supercomputer in our pocket, interconnected, so that we could access at any moment information on virtually anything that we could think about. The time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. If you move back with me to Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 12, he tells us that another sign of the end of the times is an increase of sin and coldness among the people of God in the midst of that. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Do you realize that here in Ireland, less than 1% of people would profess to be born again? Do we realize that euthanasia, as was reported in The Guardian last summer, is soaring, both legal and illegal euthanasia? That Belfast is considered the fifth most violent city in Europe, and Glasgow is considered the second most violent city in Europe, just across our borders. There is an increasing of iniquity that is going on among us, and we cannot deny it. And the result of this will be a great cooling among the people of God. As the iniquity increases, the fervency by which people love and remain committed to the Lord, it begins to affect that. The people of God begin to feel that coldness, and some will allow that to come between them and the Lord. They will allow all of the darkness which is encroaching to be something that comes into their heart and keeps them from walking with God. But another thing that will precede the end of the world will be an increasing of gospel preaching in the farthest reaches of the world. In Matthew 24 and verse 14, it says, And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Once the gospel is preached through all the world, that is when the end will come. We live in exciting days through the internet, through services like this. People have access to the gospel who never did before. They can hear gospel preaching. They can hear gospel teaching, and they can be saved through this abounding knowledge that characterizes the last day. You know, I sent out a letter on Thursday night about the needs of the church and the financial um, situation that we are finding ourselves in. But one thing that I didn't say is that there are people that have been very faithful in giving throughout this uh, pandemic. They've not missed a beat. They have stayed faithful to God regardless of what was transpiring around them. And in addition to that, they've given missions offerings. Did you know that the missions offerings are actually up in the church? That we're actually taking in more in missions now than we did before the pandemic. And this is a sign of God's leading, that he is working in hearts. He is moving them towards his ultimate purposes. And one of the glories of a thing like our church is our missions outreach, that we are sending missionaries into India, we are sending missionaries into Central America, into Southern Europe, and into the UK. We are sending a gospel witness into the world because that's exactly what God wants done in these last days. He wants the gospel preached in the ends of the earth. But in verse 13 of Matthew 24, he has an interesting phrase, and I'd kind of like to key on that. In Matthew 24, in verse 13, he says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This verse is not talking about salvation. It is clearly a prophetic verse. There are pro verses of prophecy before and after this verse. He is speaking of the plight of those who find themselves in the beginning of sorrows. He is speaking about the time when God begins to close his program for this day and this age. And that beginning of sorrows will be characterized by those things that we looked at earlier, such as war, such as the abounding of iniquity, the increase of knowledge and transportation. All of these things are occurring around us. The way that you and I 
will experience deliverance in these times is to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus, true to him and keeping him first. The word enduring here is an interesting word. Strong's, in his dictionary, defines it as to remain true, to undergo so as to bear a trial with fortitude and perseverance. It has the opposite of the idea of fleeing or running scared. It is someone who maintains allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what is going on around them. And he's saying that those that are enduring will experience the deliverance so long as they keep him first and they remain true to him. Now, this is not saying that Christians will never suffer the consequences of these epidemics. It clearly says they will. And sometimes Christians will die. That is another discussion, and that is another place. But today I would like to speak in particularly on those who are enduring and experience the deliverance that God has for them. I think what God is really saying is that he will lead his people in these times of trial and tribulation, that he has a plan for their life. He has a place prepared for them as they go through this trial. He has a deliverance that is already thought out and that is there for them. And so long as they keep him first, so long as they trust in him and walk with him through these epidemics, through the churning that continually occurs during these last days, they will experience that deliverance. The fact of the matter is, God has a plan in the midst of an epidemic. Notice with me, Elisha the Tishbite. Elisha, again, prophesied of an epidemic, a a serious multi-year drought that would leave a howling desert in the promised land. It was a result of God's judgment because ultimately God is going to bring the Assyrian nation down and depopulate that whole northern kingdom. The ten northern tribes are going to be removed. And before he does that, he allows these firebrands, Elijah and Elisha, to pr- produce a, a numerous miracles. He's doing this because he's, he's moving among his people in a very significant way. So before that happens, before the, he sends a warning, and the warning essentially is the drought. Now notice in verse number 2 of 1 Kings 17, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is beyond Jordan. So he was to cross over the Jordan and live on the east side of it, just off of one of the brooks, the brook Cherith. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the bravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. God wanted Elijah to go to a particular place that he had for him. You see, Elijah had announced a drought, and he therefore would be a target to murderous Ahab. Ahab would not hesitate to slay him if he found him. And so God said, for your deliverance, for your protection, I have prepared a place for you. God always has a place for his people. There is always something that God has prepared for them. There is always a place that he takes them to in these epidemics. These are the places of safety. Notice in verse number four, he said, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And again in verse 9, when he goes to the woman at Zarephath, he said, I have a widow woman there to sustain thee. When you're in an epidemic, the key thing to know is God's plan. Where is the place that God has sent me? Where does God want me to wait in this epidemic? That is the place of his deliverance. It is keeping Jesus first that enables us to partake of that plan. It is only known or we are only able to access this plan and this place that God has for us by keeping him first. Elijah lived in the midst of a devastating drought. And it doesn't mean that the drought didn't affect him. It simply means that the drought did not ruin him. 
God had a way of preserving him in the midst of this drought. God had a way of taking care of him while all around him there was desolation. He had to have faith in God's plan and he had to have faith to wait at the brook Cherith. Notice that again in verse 3, he told him to hide himself by the brook Cherith. In verse 4, he says, Thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. You know, believers have a most unusual testimony. Uh, believers are led by the Spirit of God, and they go to the east side of the Jordan River, and they are fed by ravens. God has a way of providing for us, and God has a way of taking care of us that we do not fully understand. He sees our tomorrow. He knows what we are going to face. And he is the one who has the plan to get us through it. What we need to do is know that he has a plan and trust him with that plan. Trust that he will take us to the place that we need to go. The world will never have the answers. The world will never have the plan. The world will never know what to do in these judgments that are going to fall in these last days. Notice, not only does he tell him to go wait by the brook Cherith, he tells him to go find a widow woman in Zarephath. Look at verse number 8 and 9. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. You see, faith enables us to follow his plan, even when it involves staying with a destitute widow woman. Now, this woman, it appears from other accounts in Scripture, is not necessarily an impoverished woman, but she has become impoverished by the drought which is raging around her. She is a widow woman with a child. She is among the most vulnerable of the people of the ancient world. God did not tell Elijah to go to a palace that had an abundance of reserves and to wait there. God told him to go to a widow woman who had virtually nothing. And the reason why is because God wanted to do something in the life of this widow woman. And I actually believe this passage is more about the widow woman than it is about Elijah. I believe that God sees within her great faith. God sees a woman who loves him and who's following him. And I think in a sense that God is testing her, that God is allowing her to go through this great and deep trial because he wants to bring her to another place. He wants to elevate her spiritual life. So Elijah shows up and he speaks to the woman and he tells her, can you get me some water? And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now the woman is willing to go down to the brook and get him some water. That doesn't cost her anything. That doesn't cut into her reserves. But now he is asking her, in the midst of a terrible um, famine situation, to give her of the teeny store of food that she has left. Now, she begins to get a little bit excited about this, which you can see in her response. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. Behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Wow. She is at seemingly the end of a rope. She does not know where the next meal is going to come from. She is expecting an impending death. The cheek of this man to ask me for some bread. I don't have any bread. Nobody has any bread. Yeah, it's one thing to ask for some, a cup of water in a famine, but to ask for bread in a famine. She fires back. The Lord thy God liveth. I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and thy son, that we may eat it and die. Sir, I don't have a loaf of bread. Far from it. All I have is a little bit left. Are you crazy? You see, for the woman to partake of God's plan, 
in this epidemic means that she had to trust God enough that she was willing to give him first out of her reserves. It was God that was calling out to her. Look at verse number 14 and, and what Elijah said. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So Elijah is telling her what God has said. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord send his rain upon the earth. He is taking her by the grace of God to a much deeper faith to a place that she could not go without an epidemic. You see, most of us are willing to be put out a little bit in an epidemic, so long as it does not touch our comfort zone, so long as it does not touch reserves. But the reserves are off limits. The woman was willing to give him some water. Perhaps she was willing to give him a room, but not the reserves. And that is exactly what Elijah pushes on. It is the thing that she is holding, the thing that she thinks will sustain her. This is the thing that is between her and starvation. This is the thing that she has to keep her and her son safe. It seems ridiculous how tightly we hold to the reserves in our life. This woman has but a handful of flour. Elisha said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Now notice that, it's important. He says to this woman, Go ahead and prepare the food for you and your son, but first, first, I want you to take care of me. First, out of that reserve that you have, out of that thing that you are looking to in this time of stress, in this time of crisis, in this time of trial, I want to know if God is first, even in the reserve. Is God the one that you are going to put first, even with that that you have left? Make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it to me, and after make for thee and thy son. Is this epidemic a cruel trick to a helpless widow woman? Or is it the very plan of God being unfolded in this desperate woman's life? Do you see that epidemics are opportunities? Epidemics are a time to where you and I can uniquely place God first in our life. It is such a different story for this woman to place God first before the epidemic or after the epidemic. But to place God first now in the midst of the epidemic, to place God first in the midst of this terrible, chaotic situation is a whole different level of faith. It is a whole different level of devotion to God. It is a whole different way that we are placing him first in our life. The fact of the matter is, when there is a bright tomorrow, when things seem stable and the flow of money is interrupted, it is easier to give. It is easier to serve. It is easier to walk with God and not be compromised. But when we come to the place in our life to where we have so little, where the world seems so uncertain, where we are holding so tightly to what it is that we have left because we do not know what is in our tomorrow. And God comes to us and God says, I want you to put me first in that. In the midst of this situation, not after this situation, not down the road when things level out a bit, but in the midst of this situation, I want you to put me first. Psalm chapter 4 and verse number 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. You see, epidemics have a way of pairing us back. Epidemics have a way of revealing things in our life that 
we didn't see about ourselves before the epidemic. You see, epidemics are great at clarifying things because they remove the extraneous. They remove the things that are peripheral and unimportant. In an epidemic, we become focused on what is primary and what is pivotal. And that is when God comes to us and God says, put me first, even when you're living on your reserves. Put me first, even when you have so little, because that is what reveals great faith. Now, you have to remember that Elijah asked this widow woman directly to put him first. He doesn't say, go look, that barrel is not going to run empty. That cruise of oil is not going to run out of oil. And then she can put him first. He says, first, in the midst of your affliction, in the midst of your loss and your deprivation, at that moment, I want you to put me first. And if she will put him first in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the epidemic, she will accelerate her spiritual growth at a whole different level. Look at verse number 15. And she went. A did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. You see, epidemics have a way of revealing priorities and crystallizing what is truly important. Now we cannot serve God out of excess, we cannot serve God out of planning. Everything becomes organic. It becomes real. We have this reserve. We have these limits. And God reaches in. And God says, I want you to trust me here. And can I tell you, it is a unique opportunity for growth in your life and growth in my life. There is a possibility of faith. There is a possibility of dependence in that situation that is not present in the situation surrounding the epidemic. We think God is taking away from us, but what God is actually doing is placing himself first for us. You see, God is preparing us for what is ahead because he knows that though there is an epidemic now, there will be other epidemics. As the last days begin to close, there is a churning that is going on. And I think what God is doing here is he is preparing for himself a people. He is growing the faith of his people. He is, he is drawing them to himself. Remember, iniquity is going to abound, and many are going to wax cold, and God is reaching into his people and saying, trust me, trust me, persevere with me, Walk with me in the midst of the epidemic. Let me raise your faith. Let me raise the level that you walk with me. Let me do this work in your life at this moment. Walk with me and see what I can do in the midst of the epidemic. The fact of the matter is, spiritual epidemics have a way of producing heroes in our world. Epidemics are more than survival. They're places of spiritual acceleration. And more than that, they are times of spiritual opportunity. They reveal so clearly what it is that we are looking to. They reveal how far we are willing to go with him. They reveal what we're willing to do and what we are not willing to do. Are we going to make him first? Are we going to keep him first? Are we going to walk with him in the midst of the crisis? Or are we going to fade? Are we going to step back? Are we going to really, when it comes down to it, look to ourselves and what we can do to resolve this situation? He says, and because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure or persevere to the end shall be saved or delivered. I really think that this epidemic, this COVID-19 is training ground. I believe God is moving among his people. And to those whose hearts are open and sensitive, 
that he's coming into their lives and, and seeing if they will keep him first. If they will walk with him, they will love him and they will serve him in the midst of an epidemic. That is fertile ground for spiritual greatness. That is the place where the spiritual giants are born. That is the place where the spiritual hero, heroes come into their own. Just beware of becoming cold and distant and self-reliant instead of reliant upon God. Let's let the epidemic reveal a great faith that is in you and I. You see, epidemics are incredible opportunities for multitudes of people to elevate their spiritual relationship. They're opportunities for people to express a much deeper and robust faith in the midst of these epidemics, they can draw close to God in a way that was so much more difficult and so much more complicated before the epidemic. In the epidemic, it really becomes very clear. It really becomes very simple. That is the opportunity. That is the place where we draw, walk with him and we draw close to him. And that is where the spiritual heroes are born. Are you going to let God make you into a spiritual giant? Are you going to let God make you into that woman that you could not be without trusting him in the epidemic, without keeping him first in the midst of the epidemic? Are we going to allow him to do that work in our life? Because no matter how dark the clouds, the sun always shines for those who are trusting God and placing him first. No matter what our circumstances may be, as we are trusting him and placing him first in these crazy situations that we come across in life, he has a plan. He has a deliverance. He has a work that he is doing in our lives and in our midst. And it is ours to seize that opportunity. It is ours to grab a hold of that work that God is doing in our lives and take that step of faith that trusts him, that says, God, I trust you, and I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to give you, God, of my reserves in the midst of an epidemic because, God, I know you're there for me, and I know that you have a plan for me, and I know that you have a way of working in my life, even in the midst of an epidemic, and God, I can trust you. And God can then do a work that is absolutely amazing in each one of our lives. God can then work in a way that really was just so much more difficult before the epidemic. He can do a work that is just so precious and so important. And he's doing that work in so many lives in the church right now. But there are more that need to let God do that work in their heart now. There are more need that need to allow God to do a work in their life in the midst of the epidemic, not after the epidemic. Not only are epidemics opportunities for people to put God first, they are ways to experience an incredible deliverance. Think of that woman having an endless supply in the midst of a, of a desolating famine, that she has an endless supply of flour, an endless supply of oil. It's amazing. She is a lighthouse. She has reserves that are endless. She has a supply that cannot be exhausted. That is the deliverance that God gives. It is not hunting around for meager sustenance in the midst of a famine. It is coming to the source of endless supply. It is coming to the one who cannot be exhausted. It is coming to the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It is coming to the one who can provide when no one else can. He is allowing us to make him first in our life in a way that we never could before this. And I pray that we will use this ep epidemic. We will allow this epidemic to be something that transforms our life. Something to where we say we are willing to trust him even in the midst of an epidemic. We are willing to walk with him no matter what comes in our future, no matter what the prognosis is with the economy. No matter what is there, I'm keeping him first. I'm walking with him because I know that his plan is better than my plan. His way is better than my way. I'm trusting him. 
And those that persevere, those that continue, he delivers. As the epidemics begin to roll, as things occur over and over and over again, periods of tranquility, and then this, and then this, and then this, there's going to be people that walk with him, that keep him first, that have an endless supply, that God is providing for them, that God is, is teaching them, that God is growing them to greater and greater things. They know his plan. They know where he wants them. They know what he wants them to do. They're trusting him, putting him first, and finding the provision that only he can give. I hope your heart is spoken to by this account of Elijah and the widow woman, as it was in my own heart this week. And I pray that it's an encouragement to you in your spiritual walk. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you would help us to walk with you, to love you, and to serve you. I pray, Father, that we would see that these epidemics that occur in life, that, Father, you can use them and you will use them in our life but we have to stay with you. <clears throat> we have to trust you. We have to come to the point of keeping you first in the midst of them. And Father, I pray that we would. I pray that we would trust you, that we would love you, and that we would serve you in the midst of these epidemics, that you might elevate our faith, that you might take us to a place we could never get to without that willingness to walk with you in the midst of the epidemic. Father, grow us and help us to become the person that you want us to become. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.